good. Jolly good. Well, welcome everybody to Live from the Archive. My name is Tom, Tom Ferber. I'm an engagement learning officer here at London Metropolitan Archives. And in the series, as the name suggests, Live from the Archive, we come live from the Archive, in particular our exhibition space, and we spend a few um, a little bit of time with a couple of items that are on, on display. It's a way for the people that are joining us at home, welcome at home, to see things that maybe they're a bit far away from or you've not managed to get a chance to. And for the people in, uh, in the archive, hello, people in the archive, it's a chance maybe to find out a little bit more about some of the things that are on display, a little bit of context, that, that, that's the idea behind it. Um, I'm very excited because obviously this is a new exhibition. This is the first live from the archive of the new, the new exhibition, uh, Unforgotten, Unforgotten Londoners, so I can get the title right, still new, still racking around a brain, Unforgotten Londoners uh, Rediscovering, um, no, Unforgotten Lives, Rediscovering Londoners of African, Caribbean and Indigenous Heritage, 1560 to 1860. I think with the new, because we've got a new exhibition, it might be nice if we start today's session with a little bit about the background of this exhibition. I think this one bears a little bit of explaining as well. So I'll have a little bit of a background to the exhibition itself, and then we're going to spend a few time with a, a bit of time with a few of the items on display, in particular this portrait behind me in, in replica, this um, archival looking replica here, and one of the documents in the case as well. So that's, that's the plan. Um, if you're listening at home, please feel free to pop questions in the chat as we, um, as, as we go along. Uh, any technical things like you can't hear it, put that in straight away, we'll get that fixed, but we'll also take questions at the end, and we'll take questions obviously from uh, those joining the person in, uh, as well. Jolly good. So this exhibition, like many, has been a long time, a long time um, uh, in, in fruition. So the, the work behind this exhibition has come out of two projects. One, I think the best part of 15 years ago, the Black and Asian Londoners um, project, and a more recent project called Switching the Lens, which started in 2020. And these ideas, Switching the Lens, Unforgotten, Unforgotten Lives, gives a kind of, I'm sure, a very good clue as to the approach we've been taking with this exhibition. So the idea with this exhibition is to foreground histories that we've known are there, they've been present in the records that, that we've hold, but for various reasons, some good and, and some ill, frankly, haven't been perhaps given the attention that they deserve. But obviously these sorts of histories are really having their moments. So we feel this is a very timely exhibition and it's a chance for us to present some of this material that we've had for a long time in a new way and to, and to foreground it. So it's probably worth me saying a little bit about switching the lens and then we could talk about unforgotten Londoners and then we can get involved and get our, sort of, um, our hands on the things itself. So switching the lens was a project that started in, in, in the pandemic, in lockdown, and it was a project to go back over our, our parish registers and other sort of real kind of everyday nuts, nuts and bolts archives that, that, that we hold. These are the stuff of family history, genealogy, to use the jargon. These are the stuff of everyday archival research but looking at it in a slightly different way. Rather than um, the, the histories that we perhaps traditionally tell, traditionally look for, use that material that exists already to work out that, to um, find those histories that have always been there, to rediscover, to unforget those, those of African, uh, Caribbean, indigenous heritage and Asian heritage as well. Hello there, welcome. Hello. Do, no, no, not at all, do, 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 do join us. Uh, we we're just talking about switching the lens, which was the, the sort of um, predecessor project to this, to this exhibition. So in that switch the lens project, we went back over old, um, material to, to represent it. That was a volunteer project and a project with the staff in here. And that produced a tremendous amount of um, quote unquote new research, new material that we were keen to present and hence the, the exhibition now. So this exhibition will run for, for, a, full, for a full year. It opened only last month. So we've got a full year of this exhibition. It's also a partnership exhibition with Northwestern, um, Northwestern University, and it's a chance for us to present some of those stories that we that we found, present some stories that perhaps we knew about already, but we can celebrate more. And we do hope across the life of the exhibition, uh, there'll be more stories will be will be dis will be discovered and uncovered as well. So, with a bit of background to the exhibition, we can now kind of delve into some of the particular things. So, can we have the next slide, please, um, Marina? So on the screen um, for you, it's, we have something called a release, and that's, for those of us in person, that's this one, the central one in the case, in the case here. And I'll be honest with you, oh, so it's, it's this one here, forgive me. It's not the most exciting document on, on, on the face of it. Actually, it's a fairly routine document. Um, 
it's a release. So what this is, this is someone being released from, released from, from debt. Um, and this is a standard piece of, of, of paperwork. Lots of the things we hold in the archive are exciting, interesting, you know, really sort of glamorous things. And lots of them are sort of the everyday, the everyday paperwork. And this is an example of that. It might just be that I've been in an archive far too long, but actually I think this is very exciting and very glamorous in its own way. Not perhaps on the face of it, but because it gives a, um, an insight into what we've been doing with both, both the Switch Lens project and the Unforgotten uh, Lives exhibition. Because this is, on the face of it, unremarkable, but we know, we know one of the names on this release, Gustavus Vassa, is actually a very interesting, interesting figure. Because Gustavus Vassa also goes by the name, perhaps we're probably better called, Ulada Equiano, and Ulada Equiano was a very prominent figure, very prominent, what might call Black Georgian, a very prominent figure in the latter half of the 18th, 18th century. And what that tells us, and actually we might move on to the next slide as well at this point, what releases like this tell us, and what the parish register that we have on the screen now as well tell us is there's a whole um, community, there's a whole network there we can just see in, in small names. And many of those names will be unknown to us. The, the, the wider biography will be unknown to us. They'll be effectively lost to history. But some of the time, and just some of the time, we can plug those names into very well-known figures. And from that, we can extrapolate to a wider history and get a wider sense of what was happening. And what we hope as well, that can be a starting point for further research to fill in more of those, fill in more of those um, blank spaces on the map, as it were, and build this, build, build this network. So we have to accept that many of the records we have will be this, this limited, there's things that we can do with it, but I think, because it's the first slide from the archive, we'll work with something we know a little bit more about and work with a slightly easier source, which is this portrait behind me. So maybe we could have the next slide, please, um, Marina? Jolly good. So, as I said, both of those, those records relate to uh, one Ulida Equiano, and that's the figure in the portrait, the portrait behind me. Before, before I think we, we go into Elida's uh, biography, it's probably worth spending a moment actually working with this image, its image itself, and then we'll find out the history of the image and what, what that can tell us. Because what we can see here from the sort of the self-presentation of this image is, is a, um, a man of some, some status. Look at, what look at what they are wearing. A fine, a fine coat, a fine, um, a fine collar, a fashionable hairstyle, um, buttons on the buttons on the coat as well. All of these are, um, if you know the code of, of um, Georgian dress, we know this is a man of some status and some and some wealth. Also, it's it's slightly obscured, sadly, by the um, by the case. But at home on the image, you should be able to see. And maybe if you sort of crane your necks uh, at home, you can see has holding a um, holding a book and if we look closely we'd see Acts of the Apostles so it's the Bible and the thumb is on a particular point which we'll come to later as well. So this is a figure that is presenting themselves as of uh, reasonably high status of wealth and literate as well and if we dig a bit deeper we can actually see the um, so this originally was the frontispiece of a book, a frontispiece of um, Elidus Equiano's um, biography, which we'll come to, to presently. This is the frontispiece of the book, so we can see this is how they're presenting themselves to the world in that way. But the form they've chosen, actually the archival form as well, if you like, is another clue to the status. So this is a particular form of engraving called stipple engraving, and it was the contemporary form of engraving in the 17, 1789 when this print was, was made. Actually, it's quite nice that it's been blown up to this size because you can actually see the individual individual dot. So this would be made with the um, an engraver with a, a sheet of uh, sheet of copper and a, a tool called a burin, putting individual stipples in that would then be inked and, and, and repeated. So this, as I say, was the most sort of advanced form of engraving, for want of a better way to put it, at the time. So uh, Ulada Kuno has also chosen to present himself uh, in the most fashionable form. So it gives us that that important sense. So as we heard, this is the frontispiece of a, um, of a book, a frontispiece of his auto, autobiography. And what we'll do now is we'll delve, delve in a little bit more into that biography and the wider significance of Elada Equiano. So Elada Equiano was born uh, in modern-day Nigeria in 1745, and at the age, uh, age 11, they were, they were 
kidnapped and uh, kidnapped and enslaved. After uh, they were uh, taken to the coast, and then from the coast, they, they endured the infamous Middle Passage. The Middle Passage was part of the so-called triangular trade in which metal, alcohol, and other goods would come from the UK to the west coast of Africa. These would be sold. In turn, um, enslaved people would be, would be bought on the west coast of Africa. They would go across the Atlantic, the Middle Passage, uh, where they would arrive in the Caribbean and the Americas, where they would be they would be sold and put and sugar and sugar derived goods such as rum would be purchased uh, in the Caribbean, tobacco from the Americas, and then the trade would go back to the to um, to Britain. Uh, yeah, Britain at this time, and that was the that was the triangular trade, and it was this middle passage that became infamous in slavery because of the sheer horror and brutality of the of of the trade, and one of the uh, one of the ways in which this um, very unpleasant and, and horrible business was um, made more public was in the biography of Aluda Equiano. So we hear in his, um, in his passage that he is, uh, he first, first he refuses to eat and then it is, um, is, is beaten until he will. He, will. Uh, he then arrives in, in, in Barbados where he, is, he is, uh, stays for two weeks before being uh, moved on to Virginia in the, in the present day United States of, of America. And some kind of key features of, of his life that's worth drawing out at this stage are partly that he is, uh, his, his name is sort of taken away from him and a new name is enforced upon him. Goes through um, three names, but the name that, the, the enslaved name that sort of stayed with us is this one of Gustavus Vasa. Uh, some of you might recognise that as a name of a um, 17th century Swedish, Swedish king. And this idea of renaming people with either um, a, for want of a better word, a generic name or a name drawn from history was a common, was a common practice. Um, typical of many enslaved people at, at this time, um, Ulaid Equiano was um, sold to mot multiple enslavers three, time, three times in, in, in total. Although Ulaid Equiano in, um, was uh, enslaved like m many people, the actual kind of conditions of his slavery were, I think, if not unique, certainly unusual in that he was a slave, not a slave on a plantation, but a slave on a, on a ship. So spent, had a, if you like, a naval, um, a naval career in, in his youth. By um, the age of 21, was able to um, actually purchase his freedom. So um, was able to work a little bit on, on the side as opposed to the, the, the forced labour that they were um, forced to undergo. Was able to, through, through trade and saving, able to save up 40 pounds to buy, buy their freedom. We also know that as part of their, in part of their adolescence, they learned to read, uh, so, yeah, learned to read and to write and were baptized as well. And then they came back to England aged, aged 21. So that would be in what, 17, the 17, 1760s. Um, worked then as a, worked then as a, uh, a servant in, ver in various households and then became part of the, um, through combination of, of writing and speaking, part of the abolitionist, uh, the abolitionist movement and was a very important figure in, in this movement due to their, uh, the, the skill of their writing. So the biography, I might need to read this title because it's a classic 18th century, very long title. So the uh, interesting narrative of the life of Elide Equiano or Gustavius Vassa, the African, published in 1789, became a seminal text in the kind of abolitionist, abolitionist movement. And then in what's sometimes called the world's sort of the, uh, history's first book tour, then promoted that, spoke about that book at various locations around, around the country, again, to sort of spread more information about the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the ordeal of, of enslavement. So in 1789, it's published. It goes through multiple editions, uh, six editions in total, and becomes a very, say, a seminal, a seminal text, and one that brings Gustavus, uh, excuse me, um, Elida, a, um, a degree of wealth as well, which goes back to the presentation that we that we that we saw. Become um, Elida is is part of this um, this network of of, um, of black Britons, of, of, of black of black Georgians. Um, and we know this in part because of their association with something called the Sons of Africa. So the Sons of Africa were, um, if you like, a group of black, um, black abolitionists working at this, uh, working at this time. 
Uh, and this is one of these hints that we've seen more at, we've seen in the exhibition and we hope to draw more out through the various work that we're doing of a, um, a, um, a network or a network or even a community that we can see developing at this, um, at this time. And incidentally, that release that we saw one of the archival documents at the, um, uh, at the start of, the, the start of this, this, this talk um, was, so a release is when you let someone off a debt, effectively. And we don't know, but we can suggest, we can interpret reading between the lines, it might be that the wealth that um, Villard Equiano was coming into as part of the sale of this book allowed him to, um, to um, um, forgive, that, forgive that debt, just an indication again. Of the, of, of the status. There's one, one final thing, I think one thing we want, we want to hint at, we want, it's, a, it's a, a, big, a big tale in, in and of itself, which we perhaps won't go into in loads of detail today, but we might pick it up in another iteration of live, live from the archive, uh, which is Elida Equiano's role in the, uh, the initial, uh, initial failed attempt to establish a, a, a colony in, Sierra, in modern day Sierra Leone. So if we go back to this, this image, the stipple engraving, this is a, a, obviously a grayscale, a black and white, a black and white image. But occasionally there's a few that in existence that have this, as, that's a colour, a colour engraving. And quite remarkably, to make a colour engraving, you have to put a dot of colour in each one of these individual indentations. So quite a thing in and in of itself. So occasionally you will see a colour version of this frontispiece and this coat is, and it will be a blue coat. And that's actually a, um, a badge of office, effectively. So it reflects, um, uh, so effectively a royal, a royal commission. And it was a commission to be part of, um, uh, as I say, an eventually failed scheme to effectively repatriate what were known as the black poor of Georgia, of Georgian Britain to a colony in Sierra Leone. The idea was that, um, that the, there was various, uh, this, this sort of proto, this black network that we're talking about, this black community in London was comprised of, of formerly enslaved people, but also the so-called black loyalists. So these were people that had fought on the British side in the American War of Independence. Uh, it was presented as an act of charity, although we can, we can maybe question some of that um, as well. But the idea was that it would be repatriating, repatriating the, the, the black Londoners to a place where they would be more able to thrive. They'd be, they would be, they would be happier. Also, likely as well that it was the sense of them not being in the right place as well. I think we can read a slightly ulterior motive into it as well. So, Elida Equiano was, was was part of that scheme somewhat reluctantly, but he was almost sort of drawn into it and, and to, to their great credit eventually left the scheme because of the, the sheer amount of corruption that was associated with it. So as, as you might imagine, bringing, um, uh, bringing, establishing a new colony requires food, supplies and other materials and there was plenty of opportunity for sort of corruption and malfeasance along the way. And Elida actually complained to the Navy about this at, at the time. Another example of them sort of standing, uh, sort of standing up for um, and that's so that I'm trying to say being part of that um, that counter to the established forces that were working at the, at the time. So we are, as I say, we're, we're in the, the the second half of the eight, of the 18th century, and this is of course the time when abolition is, is is gathering pace. And we heard that this 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 biography w w was part of that. In it's 1807 that the um, the Abolition Act is passed in, in the United, United Kingdom, 18, 1833, um, for the rest of the rest of the British Empire. Sadly, um, Elida Equino did not live to see that, died at the relatively young age of 52, um, so did, did not see that, 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 um, that, mark, that important milestone in the work that they came, that they came to create. So I hope that gives a little bit of an insight into one of the kind of the important figures in this exhibition. It gives them maybe a bit of a sense of how this exhibition uh, has come about and how we can use these small archival fragments to kind of build a picture of a, of a, of a bigger world and, and read between the lines um, a little bit. So at that point, at this point, I'm very happy to take any, any questions. So either both from people at home and in, in the room today. So what we'll do is we'll start with people uh, in the room, if anyone has any questions uh, here, and then that will give people at home a chance to get their fingers around the keyboard and we can go from there. So are there any questions over here? Okay, it's all right, maybe... Now, now yeah. The criteria for, obviously, it's, it's a, a wide-ranging exhibition, and I just wonder the criteria 
for uh, including people in it because there's obviously so many who could have been included. Yeah. So just, I'll just repeat for people at home. So the question was, what, what was the criteria for including people in, in, in the exhibition? So um, my understanding is it was a, it's a combination of um, wanting to include some of the well-known the well-known figures, people like Eloda Equiano, but then also trying to tell um, the figures that have come out of that, switching the lens and other research, and trying as best we can to give um, a, uh, a fair example of the research that we have in the kind of the, the, the types of stories, the, 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 the sorts of people that are, are, are represented, and also um, to the, those stories that we can tell with a degree of, of coherence, because obviously there's a balance between um, if we just have one line, it's hard to it's hard to say much. So, but you will you will see actually around on the bottom the names. So these are names that we've that we've located in the database. That perhaps we can't at this point, maybe never tell bigger stories about. But to kind of give that give that sense. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions from home, Marina? Not so far. Not so far. I'll give people another minute if they want to. Sometimes it takes a while to sort of think it through, get it through the fingers. Are there any questions from the room in the meantime? How difficult was it to put together? Did you find a lot of the figures, a lot of the research that you started being done by a joint mm. academic? Or were there some stories that were pretty crucial to figure out when you came together? Sure. Yeah, I'll just repeat the question. So the question was that how 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 hard was it to find to find the stories? Were there some that were already already there, and some to dig out? And again, it's it's a real mix. So someone like Alada Equiano is a well known a well known figure to, to historians at the time. The biography is very is very prominent biography, very important primary source for eighteenth century eighteenth century history. You might say the same about say Ignatius Sancho, who's just off camera. I'm afraid these are very well known very well-known sources that probably make it into the more mainstream sort of established narratives of, of, of this time and of the time. But then the others, some of it, some of the figures will be sort of half known and then some unknown. So some of them, a lot, a lot of work has gone into it and to that we need to thank both the staff here at LMA but probably even more importantly it's a volunteer project as well and the collaboration with Northwestern um, University. So they're the people that have really the volunteers that unearth the, these stories. So some of it, some of them will be new, new figures, and they'll be, the, and sometimes the work is around finding a name in one source, and then what other sources can you have that then line up and, and flesh, out, excuse me, and then flesh out that that story. Thank you. Any questions from home, Marina? No, not yet. Jolly good. Well, I think we'll give you one last chance at home if you do have anything you'd like you'd, you'd like to know. Um, if something comes along later please feel to reach us on social media or you can write in directly and we'll be happy to, happy to answer them. So with that being said, thank you for coming in person. Thank you for joining me um, at home as well. These, these Live from the Archive presentations are the first Tuesday of the, of the month, so we might see some of you in a month's time as well. I certainly hope so. Thanks again.